One disadvantage of flows is that they have to operate on the same scale in the latent space as in the input space. So if we have as input 28 times 28 pixels, our latent space also has to be 28 times 28. This can be a bit difficult, especially in the coupling layers, as because in the coupling layers, we would also want to have global properties of the image. Right? So we would want to capture the whole 28 times 28 pixels as a receptor field. However, this gets quite costly in the neural networks we apply in there. The alternative, which is used in state-of-the-art models, is a multi-scale architecture, which takes our uh, latent space and actually reorganizes it so that it reduces scale in height and width dimension. How exactly does it do it? So I try to visualize it here. Let's say we have an input image of 4x4 with a single channel, and we have a operation called squeeze, and squeeze then uh, organizes the input differently in the sense that we uh, take all the 2 by 2 grids here in the height and width and organize it in the channel dimension. So we end up with a 2 by 2 times 4 channels output now. The advantage is that we have now a lower height and width so that we can, for example, apply still a CNN on it without any disadvantages of having a low receptive field. This is why the squeeze flow is often used for multi-scale architecture. We can also just uh, here shortly print it out so that you can just see, so if we have one, two, three, four, we have then therefore organize it here into the channel dimension while we can simply reverse it. Right? So we can always, if I get this input, I can simply reverse the operation. What also uh, multi-scale flows do is then that we say, okay, actually at some point we don't need all these latent dimensions. A lot of them, a lot of pixels, for example, I can infer from any other pixels very easily with low amount of information. The idea that when flows uh, well, follow here is that given when this input image throughout the flow, like through half of the flow, I will cut my latent space into half and say half of it is already done, being transformed, the other half I will continue to transform even further. So this way I basically reduce my latent space through my flows, all through in the end, I have still the same dimensionality. At first sound a bit complicated, below here I try to visualize it what we will actually do later on, so maybe I can just execute it up here. So what we have is that given the input image, we first run again our dequantization, Coupling layers, we apply a squeeze flow so that from the 28 times 28 we go down to 40 times 14. We can apply again a few coupling flows and then apply a split. What the split does is basically saying, okay, half of the channels, the 2 by 40 by 40, I directly forward to my prior. Say so these ones are done. The benefit is that when these other coupling layers can focus on the rest of the latent space, and we know that this space is actually modeling the, uh, the more high-level information, while the low-level information here, which we will say, okay, if a value is now 2 or 3, that doesn't matter, we just know it's low. And this is basically this noise, which exact value it is, which could be forwarded here directly to the prior. The benefit of this architecture is that it's then more efficient and smaller and therefore faster to run. Same time, with these squeeze flows, we will also be able to model global context, which we will actually try out here. So I built here a multi-scale flow, so exactly the architecture we have up here. And we will first train all of them, but maybe before that, um, we can also print the parameters. Uh, so you see that I actually have much more parameters in my multi-scale flow up here. This is because as we scale down the height and the width, we need to have more channels, right? because we now need to have actually more feature channels as we have more input channels. At the same time, this is still okay, so although we have more parameters, it will be more efficient. So in the end, what we care about is that we have a model which can do sampling and uh, likelihood estimate, estimation fast, right? while the number of parameters is not that important here. This is why below here we train now our three models. So we train here one with uh, 
stable dequantization without any multiscale flow, one no multiscale but variation dequantization, and then a final one, multiscale flow with variational dequantization. The first part we can uh, compare the models on is based on the likelihood estimate. So we have trained it now on a training set. How well do I actually model for the likelihood of the test set? So we can just simply run here our table to print it. And what we will see is that actually our multi-scale flow is significantly better than the others. So we see here all of them are around one bit per dimension, uh, while the multi-scale flow is still quite some better than the variation dequantization high scale, while also this flow is faster than the one, uh, better than the dequantization flow. Um, this, these scores might appear quite high compared to your assignment scores on a, a variation autoencoder, just because the VAE uses here a binarized data set right between zero and one, while here we have zero to 255, so a much harder task. Then I also try to a plot here with Fion's time and sampling time. And Fion times mean, given the image, how fast can I determine its likelihood and how fast can I actually sample a new batch of images. And there you see that the multi-scale flow is much faster in both directions. And this is because it's just using smaller uh, scale. Also, it has more channel size and also uh, is therefore more parameter heavy. Uh, it's just faster, which is quite good, uh, is exactly what we want, right? You also see that inference time is actually much slower than sampling. This is because we have in the inference time the variational dequantization, and right? we have to determine the distribution of the noise. Well, however, in sampling, I don't need it, because the reverse operation of variation dequantization is exactly the same as dequantization. That's why you also, if we compare, the simple and the variation of dequantization, so we only see a time difference in the inference time. Let's maybe also sample a few. Let's first uh, sample from the variation of dequantization model, and there you see this is more local structures that don't resemble anything like a digit. Well, if we take the multi scale flow, you now see digits. And there it really shows that multi scale flow is able to capture global context compared to our flows, which operate on the 28 times 28 case all the time. Another thing we can try is, of course, interpolating in latent space. As we said here, our big benefit is that we can now take any image, have find its point in latent space as we have a one-to-one -one invertible mapping. Also here, we actually have a volume-to-volume -volume mapping um, because we have a dequantization, right? And therefore, we can actually perform some interpolations so this one up here is again for the variation dequantization. See from the 7 to 6, it is not very good, so it again becomes not a digit, while our multi-scale flow actually transforms the 7 first to 8, and the 8 comes into a 6. So this again shows you that we model here global context, while if we stay on a higher scale that we usually can't. Another thing we can actually check is, okay, we had our flow up here, Right, so if I go here of the multi-scale flow, remember that we had now two parts of the latent space. What is actually if you just sample one new and the other one we keep constant? And that you can see below here, um, which come here. So these eight pictures have the same high-level latent variables while different low-level latent variables. And you see that we can't really spot differences, small differences you can spot. Um, but this already shows you, yes, we have a high-level and a low-level latent variables if we use a multi-scale flow with splitting. Finally, what we can do is to look again at the dequantization. So we had a flow trained on variational dequantization, one on simple dequantization. Right? So how do these prior distributions look like? So if I would imagine, okay, I don't actually care about this 28 times 28 pixels and this, but I look at each pixel independently what distribution would I actually have for p of x plus u, so with the noise. If we now look just at dequantization, at simple dequantization, you see a heavy bias here around zero, which is because m is mostly dark, right, black. And you see also here again this hard border. So this is very hard for the model to really model. While if we use variational dequantization where we allow the model to learn the distribution, 
we see it actually models here Gaussian, which means that it makes the job for itself much easier to push uh, this Gaussian or basically this distribution of zeros to a Gaussian distribution. This is what basically these flows do. Finally, then we come to the conclusion of this notebook. So in this notebook, we have seen how we can train normalizing flows, how we can apply them for images. One very big part of normalizing flows and images are dequantization techniques. So we have to put this discrete image into continuous space as otherwise we cannot model it. Otherwise we get these degenerate so uh, solutions. While we also see, have seen that multi-scale architectures are really a big uh, thing if you want to go to larger images. Normalizing flows are not limited to images, so they can also apply to many different things. And I think that normalizing flows in general are a very exciting research area, which we will see actually a lot still for the next uh, years coming up, especially because also now neural ODEs have also come into play which are nothing else than normalizing flow with infinite layers, so with infinite number of flows, which can have also a significant impact on other uh, fields of deep learning.